If you don't know what this little uh, creature is in the bottom right, when, when Linkerd graduated, we had to uh, pick a mascot, you know, because they have all those cute little animals for Kubernetes and for Go and all that. And so we tried to pick, we tried to think of like what was the least cute animal that we could pick and lobster was the one that we ended on. And um, it's actually a blue lobster, which is very rare, you know. So if you ever see one of those in the wild, don't, don't eat it. And then we had to answer a bunch of questions about like, is, does this lobster, what, what gender is the lobster? And I did a lot of research and it gets complicated. So I'm, I'm gonna leave that for, for you all to research at home, how to tell, you know, uh, the gender of a lobster. All right, I changed the subtitle just now. Those of you who were in the audience saw me do this live. I promise that being here does not make you a boring person. Despite this very boring title and the fact that I am boring, I'm gonna try and make this really exciting. This is our uh, Linkerd maintainer kind of project update that we get to do every KubeCon. So I really appreciate you uh, coming out here and, and listening to me. And you know, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you have a question at any point. I'd love to make it more interactive and, and not just me monologuing, but I may get lost in the, in the beauty of what I'm saying. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. All right, this uh, was supposed to be delivered by Alex. Uh, unfortunately, Alex is filling in for another talk. Um, so I'm going to be delivering this in her stead. But Alex will be delivering a talk that m probably will be much more interesting than this one called Five Years of Cloud Native Rust. That's today at 2.30 on level three. I think you can, if I did my QR code right, you should be able to just scan that. Otherwise, you can just type in 1R2QN. One of the things I'm only going to mention very briefly in this talk, but Alex is really going to go into, is uh, the investment in Rust that we've made. So, you know, it's been, as you can see, five years. Uh, and a lot of what makes Linkerd great today comes from this very early decision and, uh, you know, a lot of kind of the pain and suffering that came along with that to adopt Rust and to, and to adopt this very particular approach where, you know, every aspect of, the, of, of Linkerd's data plane is, um, you know, is kind of informed by not just Rust, but around the asynchronous network ecosystem uh, that's been built up in Rust. So please do attend this talk. Um, so this is me, uh, William Morgan, thank you for being here. I've, you know, I used to do this talk a lot and I actually haven't done it for a couple of years, so uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. This is a picture of me fixing a toilet in the very early days of Linkerd development. This was basically my best contribution to the project, um, arguably, at least that's what some people have told me. All right, I'm going to do a very brief intro into what Linkerd is, and you know, if you've seen this a thousand times before, then you know, just bear with me. Uh, it's a service mesh. I'll, t I'll spend one slide describing what that is. Uh, it's known for being light, for being fast, for being security fo uh, first, and it's also known for being simple, and that's really the focus uh, for us. Created by a company called Buoyant, which I love, um, and please, you know, pay us a lot of money. Uh, seven, over seven years in production, 9,500 Slack channel members. We're, we're close to hitting 10,000, so if you haven't gone to slack.linkerd.io, you don't have to do anything, just sign up so I can get this number to, to 10,000. Um, if I see anyone in here who's, you know, at the next talk at KubeCon Paris next year, and we're not at 10,000, I'm going to be uh, upset at you for not joining. Um, make sock puppet accounts if you need to. Everything's fair in the, uh, you know, in, in love and cloud native. Uh, lots of GitHub stars, lots of contributors, uh, weekly edge releases, and so on. We were the first uh, service mesh to graduate, uh, the CNCF, a couple of years ago. And our job, you know, the job of Linkerd is to give every platform engineer in the world the tools that they need to create secure and reliable and observable cloud-native applications. So hopefully that resonates with you. Um, if not, then <laughs> this may be a very boring talk. All right, it's a link, uh, Linkerd is a service mesh. I promised I'd, I'd spend one slide on this. You know, so the way I think about this uh, is a service mesh is an infrastructure layer, right? So it's not something that the developers have to interact with directly. It's something that should be kind of provided to them as part of the infrastructure. Uh, it's at the platform layer, and it, you know, in a way, it's kind of like this modern L7 capable network. So if you come from a networking background, you're very used to, you know, what I would call L4 stuff, which is you got packets and you know you've got IP addresses and you're trying to deliver packets from this IP address to that IP address. I know I'm like summarizing a lot of stuff in in a, in a really short way. Um, and then for but for Linkerd, we kind of think we're thinking about things in, in in L7 versus L4, which means we're thinking about rather than IP addresses, we're thinking about workloads, you know, or rather than uh, and, and workload identities, um, you know, rather than 
TCP connections and TCP packets. We're thinking about um, HTTP2 connections and gRPC messages and things like that. And, and so it's, it's kind of a different level um, of, uh, of networking. And you know, uh, the goal for us is this should be uniform across your entire application. So all these benefits you, know, you get kind of regardless of what the application was written in and what team wrote it. Uh, you shouldn't have to change your application. For the most part, that's true. There's always one or two little asterisks that we have to navigate through. Um, and then our implementation, as I mentioned, is, is this idea called a, a micro proxy. So we build it in Rust, try and make it as small and as lightweight and as single purpose as possible. So if you're familiar with Envoy, it's a general purpose proxy. The Linkerd proxy is not general purpose. You can't use it in any context other than Linkerd. Um, and that is part of what allows us to, to make it slim and trim. Uh, and then we've got a control plane off the, to the side that kind of manages those proxies for you and gives you the interaction points you know, through CRDs or, or, or elsewhere. Um, to, to interact with Linkerd as a whole. This makes sense so far to everyone? Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads, thank you. Come on in, you're not too late, I'm just going through the intro stuff. All right, what makes Linkerd so darn good? Um, so for us, we got a couple kind of design goals. One is we wanna make it just work, so we wanna make it so if you have a functioning Kubernetes application that runs today and you add Linkerd, the application continues to function. And you know, 99% of the time we can do that, uh, of course, there's always one or two asterisks. Um, and it's also a very good way of finding out whether your developers have obeyed the standards when it comes to things like HTTP calls. Have they made uh, assumptions about header ordering or about header casing and things like that? You know, that's, uh, that'll be a fun, uh, fun discovery for you uh, as you add Linkerd. Um, because we do require those, <laughs> we do require the applications to conform to those standards. Uh, Ultralight, of course, I've talked about, simple to operate, you know, that's kind of our promise to you is you are the poor souls who are gonna be on the hook for waking up at three in the morning if this thing goes down. You know, we want to minimize that as much as possible and we wanna give you the ability to just have in your head, like, is there a model of how this thing works? And when things are behaving, you know, uh, contrary to that model, you can ask a really informed question rather than just believing it's this black box of magic, you know, complicated stuff. Uh, and then, of course, we want to make it secure, uh, you know, and, and, and treat that as um, kind of like the default behavior, not as something that you have to enable or configure to the, to the extent that's possible. Okay, control plane, data plane, et cetera. Um, these slides are basically online, so, you know, if, if anything I'm saying goes by too fast, you'll, you'll be able to, to, to find them. All right, the data plane, as I mentioned, Rust microproxy is not using Envoy. Okay, this gives us a, a whole bunch of interesting um, kind of characteristics. You know, part of this is, is part of our security first approach. So Rust allows us, if you're not familiar with Rust, really interesting language. Uh, you know, Alex's talk later today will be, uh, will have a lot more examples. Actually, I think she's got examples of what, things you can do in C++ that are terrible that the Rust compiler will not let you do. So there's some fun kind of code side by side stuff there. Um, but it allows us to avoid an entire class of memory vulnerabilities that are basically endemic to you know, C and C++ code. Turns out no human being in the world can actually write safe C++ code um, beyond hello world maybe. Ultra light, ultra fast, you know, so we compile the native code, um, state of the art networking stack, all sorts of fun stuff in here. Uh, you know, and, and really we wanna, we wanna make this thing an implementation detail, right? So if you are a service mesh operator, you should not, and, and you become an expert in Linkerd, you should not have to become also an expert in the Linkerd proxy. All right, now let's get into the controversial stuff. This is my opinion. Well, okay, yeah, that's my opinion. Um, so there's kind of three, you know, if you're very familiar with the service mesh landscape, there's kind of three approaches people have taken. There's node proxies, which actually came first because the very first version of Linkerd was node proxies. Um, there's sidecars, which is what we are today. And then there's this newer idea of ambient. EBF, EBPF comes up a lot in some of these conversations. Uh, it's basically a red herring because EBPF is great for L4 features, right? We talked about the network and packets and things like that. It's great, it's amazing for that, but it can't really handle L7 features, not the way that, we, that, that the service mesh needs it to handle because the way that the thing works is it is limited by design because you have to run these bytecodes in the kernel, right? And so you have to be very, very strict on what you're allowing uh, to run in the kernel. So that's fine, right? It's not a knock on eBPF. It's good for some things, not good for other things. But what happens is when you make a sidecar-free eBPF service mesh, you end up using node proxies, and that actually is bad, right? Because node proxies mean that you share all the TLS information, it means that you share all of the requests from very disparate workloads all going through that single proxy. 
Um, we saw this live with Linkerd uh, and firsthand with Linkerd 1.x, which was node proxies. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the initial adopters from uh, of Linkerd uh, uh, 1.0 uh, told us how painful this was. So that was part of the kind of reinvention of, of Linkerd, you know, circa 2018 to move into the sidecar world. Um, Ambient is better. I'm not going to talk too much about that. It is very complicated, um, but it at least has better security pro properties. Um, we did do a long exploration of eBPF. I think the TLDR, and if you read this um, blog post that I wrote about it, I think it's likely we'll add eBPF at some point to Linkerd, but I don't think it really is going to change a lot for it. Um, sidecars and microproxies are the, the best solution after doing a thorough analysis. They continue to be the best solution um, for, for serious users. They have a really clear operational and security boundary, right? That's a, there's a huge benefit to that. You've got a really clear implementation of things like zero trust. If you're an operator, you know, you have a model in your head that is very straightforward, and there's a lot to be said for that. Minimal resource usage, of course, if you're going to have sidecars, like, you've got to make them small, because if they're large, then, you know, then it's, well, it's not that great. Um, and there are some warts around sidecars in Kubernetes, like, if any of you have tried to mesh, you know, cron jobs and, or jobs, things like that, uh, you know, it's, it's annoying and you have to do some extra work. Those are slowly being uh, fixed at the Kubernetes level, so there's some really cool stuff happening with uh, sidecar, um, sidecar containers and, and, and stuff like that. I wrote a little blog post about this. 1.28 was when, they, when those first came into alpha, and 1.29, they're going to, I don't know, they're getting betterified in, in some way. So that's all to say at the end of all that, you know, eBPF probably is on the roadmap for Linkerd, but I don't think it's going to change a whole lot. Um, it's it's going to have a pretty minor effect. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to jump with that. Let's see. Oh, we're doing okay for time. Um, but I'll jump into uh, kind of a little history of some of the recent releases, and then I'm going to end with kind of what we're building in the, in the next release. So 2.12, which is, gosh, I don't even remember when this was, a couple, couple of releases ago, um, introduced uh, security policies that were per route. So the, the security model for Linkerd is that we can enforce, remember, because we, we have the sidecar and we're kind of, in, you know, at the, at the pod boundary, right, and all traffic before it can touch the application on that pod has to go through the proxy. Um, we, uh, the, the security model is at that point we can actually enforce, you know, what kinds of requests are allowed to talk to the application. And you can describe those requests to us and you can describe them in, in any way that you want. You know, you can describe them based on IP addresses, but you know, we're trying to move to the, the security model of the future where we're talking about workload identities and things like that. So you can describe them in terms of workload identities and you can describe them in, time, in terms of routes. So you can say, I am service B, you're service A, and in order for A to talk to B, you know, it, it is allowed to talk to B, you know, on the slash foo endpoint, but not on the slash bar endpoint, things like that, right? So this is, we're talking about workload identity and kind of per route or per gRPC method granularity. The way that we implemented this is using this thing called the Gateway API, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gateway API because it's kind of a, a, a recurring theme for Linkerd, and it's, and it's kind of this future direction um, that, that we're headed. Um, so this is an HTTP, example of an HTTP route that permits certain requests to a server, which is a, you know, another type of object called the author's server. And so, you know, the goal here is we want to give you kind of this really granular level of control, but we also want to do it in as standard a way as possible. So rather than implementing, you know, uh, Linkerd specific CRDs, we try and do it with the Gateway API. Again, there's one or two asterisks to that statement, um, but by and large, that's, that's the goal, right? And then 2.13, okay, after that, so that 2.12 2 is very security focused, right? Giving you those policies. 2.13, now uh, um, we're getting into uh, uh, kind of uh, back to the world of routing, away from security, back to the world of routing, and giving you a similar capability with request routing. So giving you the ability to say, I want to route traffic, you know, um, not just based on the kind of the, the DNS uh, name, but based on headers, based on verbs. We don't look at the body um, for a variety of reasons, but this is a very fine-grained way of routing requests kind of dynamically based on these routes. Uh, again, configured with the Gateway API, not with SMI components. If you've been a Linkerd user for a while, you're probably familiar with traffic splits and, and things like that. Those were based on this SMI um, API. In the modern world, we're trying to move um, off of SMI and onto HTTP route. 
Um, and so we use that same object that was introduced in the previous release. Great, so now, we've, you know, now we're starting to have like a really uniform configuration space. And there's all sorts of interesting examples of, of how you can build upon this to do things like you know, per user canaries and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing we introduced here was circuit breaking. Uh, so this is something you know, I think came a little late to, to, to Linkerd, you probably should have done it earlier. Um, and the idea here is like, if an endpoint is failing, right, we should just stop delivering traffic to it because we know it's failing and because reducing traffic to it might allow it to recover, right? It might be dying because there's too much traffic. So if you've got too many consecutive failures, if the success rate is too low, then we're gonna turn traffic um, off. And then as it recovers, so we're gonna ping it every once in a while when it recovers, we'll start sending traffic back to it. So that was 2.13. And then finally, 2.14 is the most recent release. So this is um, a flat network. This is where we introduced flat network multi-cluster. So in 2.13 and earlier, so Linkerd has had multi-cluster uh, capabilities for a long time. And by what multi-cluster means in Linkerd's case is the ability to send traffic from one cluster to another Kubernetes cluster in a way that's transparent to the application. So the application, you know, again, I'm, I'm service A and I'm talking to service B. All I have to do is connect to B like the normal way that I do, and I don't have to know whether B is on the same cluster, it's on a different cluster, whether it's like halfway in between these clusters because I'm splitting traffic across them, whether I'm in the middle of some kind of failover operation, that's all independent um, you know, from, uh, from, uh, from the application's point of view, right? You just talk to the service. And so that gives you a lot of flexibility. You know, under the hood, the way we implemented this was um, with, a, with a gateway. I'm sorry, is there supposed to be a gateway picture here? Okay, there we go. This makes a lot more sense. Right, yes, yeah, so under the hood, we have a gateway on the destination side, right? So if you're workload one and you're talking to workload two, it goes through this gateway object, right? And you don't, you know, the application doesn't know about that. That's kind of happening under the hood. The reason we did that is because the primary use cases that we saw for multi-cluster in, in kind of the early days of Linkerd were kind of these ad hoc use cases where I have a cluster over here and now, you know, separately we add this other cluster over there and it might be on a different cloud or it's in a different zone or it's like, you know, owned by a different team. And so this gateway-based approach was really nice because all you had to do, the only L4 requirement that you had here was you need to be able to establish a, a TCP connection from the cluster on the left to that gateway. But that was it, right? We didn't make any other assumptions about the, the underlying networking. Now, what we've seen uh, you know, more recently is, um, if, you, if the under, underlying network allows pods, right? Yeah, yeah, great. So, right, so if you actually do your network setup you know, in, in kind of a, a, a more forward-thinking way, and you can actually route the pods, you know, pods can route traffic to each other, well, then we can get rid of the gateway, right? And then you end up with a very, <laughs> very boring diagram that looks like this. You know, again, workload one doesn't know where workload two is, so Linkerd is kind of taking care of that under the hood for you, um, but then you can, you know, you can get rid of that gateway component. This has a couple other nice benefits. Of course, you're not going through um, a gateway, so that's one fewer hop. Um, and, uh, you know, you also preserve the identity on the, from the left-hand side, so that's kind of nice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so the question was, what do you mean by an underlying network that allows you to do this? So the, the, uh, this is basically a, a shared flat network, so you have all the pods, and my network you know, engineering knowledge is about one level deep, so I'll describe this as best I can, but it means that all the pods are, can route traffic to each other, so they're on the sh same shared flat network. They have IP addresses that are uh, unique across all clusters, not just unique within the. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And if anyone wants to correct me on what that means, raise your hand. Don't nat between the pods. Go straight from pods. Cider to pod cider. Okay. Thank you, yeah. So, you know, it's an alternative mode. We didn't throw away the, the first mode. This is just, if you're in this situation, hey, great, you know, we can save you a component. Um, and, you know, all sorts of interesting engineering challenges that I was kind of, uh, you know, half exposed to here around service discovery and things like that. Um, but the details are all in the, you know, the docs and blog posts and, and stuff around that. Um, the other thing we did in 2.14 is we officially became conformant with the Gateway API, which is, you know, uh, again, I keep using those words. Basically, the Gateway API was, or is, 
um, a, a set of APIs that was originally designed to replace or to you know, provide a successor to the ingress resource. So the ingress resource, which we all know and love, you know, was something that we often had to work around because it was so limited. The Gateway API was designed originally to, to have this really expressive set of CRDs that you could use you know, to describe the full set of uh, you know, uh, behavior you want on, on ingress. And they did a really good job in designing this API. They did such a, you know, so, so good of a job that actually a lot of it applies to the service mesh. So at some point, um, you know, the, that the Gateway API team said, well, gosh, let's actually make this, you know, work for service meshes as well as for ingress. And so they added this idea of different profiles, and there's a mesh profile. Linkerd was the very first service mesh to be fully conformant with the Gateway API mesh profile. It's really exciting if you're like a deep Kubernetes nerd. If you're a user, I don't know that it really is that interesting, except to say that it is a step towards a goal that I'm kind of excited about, which is we have a, f a fully uniform set of configuration for Linkerd and for Ingress with the same set of APIs, same set of uh, you know, CRDs and, and types and things like that. And I think that will be a big benefit because then, you know, A, you have, some, you, know, you have some flexibility in terms of like, you know, here's the API for controlling my service mesh and maybe I swap out the implementation underneath without having to change any of that. And B, you have one set of things that you're thinking about when you're configuring Ingress and for mesh, or one set of tools that you're working with, I guess, when you're configuring those two things. And to me, that kind of makes sense because a lot of the constraints you know, and, and, and goals are the same. Um, th there was, you know, things got a little, the, the, this standard is still evolving, so there are one or two warts where, when you're actually trying to do this. Um, but uh, so this is kind of, I would say this is a stepping stone, um, but maybe not the, you know, we're not at the final uh, end state yet. All right, so 2.14 was our most recent release. Now, finally, we're going to get to 2.15, so this is an exciting kind of announcement time. Um, so the goal for the next release is to add mesh expansion, which is the ability to add off-cluster, non-Kubernetes things into the mesh. So that means we can run the data plane outside of Kubernetes. So on the one hand, that's really, really easy because, you know, these Rust microproxies will run anywhere, like we can compile them for any architecture and they run, you know, it's just a binary. They're actually, you know, we, we did one clever thing early on, which is we did not make those proxies Kubernetes specific at all. They're Linkerd specific, so I need to talk to the Linkerd API, but they don't know anything about Kubernetes. They don't have any assumptions in there that they're running on a Kubernetes cluster or even in a, in a container, right? They're just regular old fashioned binaries. But, you know, that's the one simple aspect. Every other aspect of this is really, really hard. Um, there's a whole set of challenges around, well, how do we do service discovery? How do we do, um, you know, network connectivity? When we're running within Kubernetes, you know, we have all these assumptions we can make. Kubernetes gives us all these primitives that we can build upon. We can, you know, oh, you need to get the, you know, the sidecar, you know, uh, into every pod. Well, sure, you just use a mutating admission webhook controller and, you know, there you go. When you're out in the, wor uh, the world of VMs, well, you don't have any of those primitives. So you have to decide, okay, which of these, you know, are we gonna actually rebuild? And which of these are we gonna leave as a burden for you, right, <laughs> the, the, the user? Um, one that I wanna talk about briefly here, because, you know, this one became really interesting, is this idea of workload identity. So all the policies that I talked about earlier in, in Linkerd 2.12, right, all of our kind of like authorization, you know, framework, is based on this concept of workload identity. We don't want to use the IP address. We don't want to trust the network, right? We want to trust cryptographic proof of, you know, of strongly attested workload identity. In Kubernetes land, we can use your service account as the workload identity because that, you know, for purposes of security, it's basically tantamount to your identity. Once you're outside the cluster, well, we don't have that anymore, right? So now we have to come up with a way of providing identity for like an arbitrary application on an arbitrary VM. Turns out there actually is a project that's basically solved this, so that's great for us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's called Spiffy Inspire. Um, has anyone here used Spiffy or is using it today? Raise your hand, don't be shy. I see one half-hearted hand on the far right. Anybody else? That's it? It's a graduated project. Is anybody too embarrassed to admit that they use it? Raise your hand. Oh, there we go. Okay, two hands. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know what the, I mean, gosh, okay. <laughs> Maybe this was a bad idea. Well, mostly I just don't want to have to rebuild all this stuff, so, you know. Um, right, so, you know, and, and kind of the division here, 
uh, is that Spiffy is a standard, you know, and, and Spire is effectively a reference implementation. And all that Spiffy does is it says, hey, if you take a, you know, what's called an X509 certificate and you format, you know, th these fields in this way, then you now have a Spiffy ID. And, you know, there's it's more complicated than that. There's like a JWT version, a JWT version, things like that. But it turns out those, those uh, you know, those X509 certificates are exactly what you use for TLS, and including for Linkerd's mutual TLS. So that integration is very, very natural. Now the question is, okay, if I have the standard for, you know, presenting identity that's kind of already implemented in, in, in Linkerd, well, how do I actually get the identity for an arbitrary machine? And that's where Spire comes in. So you run Spire, Spire gives you a spiffy certificate for, you know, a workload or, you know, or, or, or whatever you're trying to attest. So we're basically in late prototyping stage with this. It's going along really, really well. I expect to have a stable release. I, I should never do this. I should never put a date on a slide in a recorded fashion. So editors, just beep out the next section, please. But early next year, it's looking really good. Uh, and I just wrote a little blog post about this a couple days ago if you want, if you want to learn more. Yes, sir. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, does Spiffy Inspire, for anyone who's using it out there, does that interact with Cert Manager? You know, does Cert Manager do anything with Spiffy Inspire? What about the one half-hearted hand over there? You want to you tackle that? Okay, so he believes Spire would be doing the rotation and management. Anybody have a different opinion? Yes, over there. Cert Manager does interact with Spiffy Inspire. Okay, great. Uh, okay, there's a combination you can use. Yeah, <laughs> okay, great, great. Yeah, great, great question, though. Um, any other questions on this? Yes, sir. Yes, that's right. So you would run the proxy. The question was, do you run the proxy on the VM? Yes. Yeah, so you run the proxy on the VM. <clears throat> what, you know, how much help we can give you in delivering that proxy to the VM and getting everything set up and all that is, is kind of what we're exploring now. But ultimately, yes, that proxy sits there. It gets an identity not from Linkerd CA sitting on the cluster, but from, from Spire, and then it establishes a connection to the control plane. Any other questions on this? I'm really excited about this because, um, you know, it finally gets back to the, the in, in Linkerd 1.x for the elderly amongst us here who remember that, we actually were able to run on VMs and, uh, you know, on Mesos and on Nomad and like, you know, it's totally orchestrator independent and I'm, I'm excited to be able to at least get partially back that way. The control plane still has to run on Kubernetes, so we're really talking about the data plane that gets to expand. Um, and this is also a good lesson why you should never raise your hand when someone asks a question because then you'll be called on to, you know, to answer follow-up questions. Okay, and that's really it. We've got six and a half minutes left, um, so we can do a little more questions and answering. If you want to get involved, of course, you can talk to, you know, you can talk to me. Uh, all the development is happening on GitHub. We have slack.linkerd.io, which please everyone join so we can get to 10,000. People there, um, uh, we've got mailing lists if you want the formal announcements. We do uh, the CNCF funds, formal third party uh, security audits. Yeah, I think we have a pretty friendly and welcoming um, community. I do have two quick ads um, and then we'll jump into questions. Uh, Buoyant itself runs these free engineer focused uh, training things called Service Mesh Academy. So if you are interested in learning more about Linkerd, uh, myself and a couple other uh, of the Linkerd folks do deliver this educational content. I think it's pretty good. We get pretty good reviews. It's all free, so you don't have to do it. Um, we also have an enterprise distribution. Uh, if you're running multi-AZ clusters especially and sp spending lots of money, please come talk to me afterwards. And that's really it. So five and a half minutes exactly remaining. Any questions? Let me, I'm, I'm going to come to you in a second, Amir. Let me start over here. Yes, sir.
Yeah, great question. So the question was, you know, Linkerd, the data plane at least is written in Rust. What has the experience been like? You know, what kind of advantages? What's been bad? The, the right place to learn more about that is at Alex's talk at 2.30, because um, she's going to dive into all of that stuff. I'd say, uh, from my perspective, it was a real gamble early on, because Rust in 2018 was like, uh, you know, the language was there, but the ecosystem was like barely there. Um, it's really paid off, though. Like, almost everything that I think is really powerful and unique and, and, and amazing about Linkerd is because of that choice. Yeah, great question, but do, do go to that talk. All right, uh, Amir. Ah, I do have some updates about Buoyant Cloud, but I don't want to talk about them here because I want to keep it as open source as possible. <laughs> but thank you, I appreciate that question. All right, yes, sir, networking expert in the middle. So the question was, when you're doing mesh expansion, there's configuration. Does that configuration happen on the VMs or does it happen on the cluster? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I would, my, my guess, and you know, Flynn back there, please correct me if I'm wrong. My guess would be there's gonna be an amount of configuration that has to happen on the VM because you have to tell, if nothing else, you have to tell the VM where, you know, where Linkerd is. Happy to talk more about that. All right, yeah, come, come find Flynn or find myself afterwards and we'll figure out the right answer. But yeah, great, great question. All right, uh, anyone else? Another question? We're gonna sit in silence, lock the doors. Yes, Joe, please. Okay, so the question was, Joe here is a cheapskate <laughs> and has GPUs, and, he, and you wanna know, can you, can you use mesh expansion to bridge the GPU and your, and your local Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, my understanding is yes, as long as those GPUs can run like, you know, a, a, a binary, a Linux, you know, have enough Linux primitives that we can do like the networking stuff that we need to do and can run a binary, then yeah, that should be just fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, great question. So the question was, multi-cluster, is that primarily targeted at having many, many clusters in the same region, or could that be used for you know, clusters in different regions or different clouds? The gateway approach, kind of the original approach, doesn't care. So yes, you can use that in multiple clouds. We, we have adopters today who you know, are doing a multi-cloud approach and tie these things across you know, from one cloud to the next. The, that gateway connection is mtls you know, so it's secure. You can put it over the open internet and you can feel confident in that. The flat network approach doesn't work across regions. You need to have like the, the L4, L3, L4 capabilities, you know, sorted out there, I believe. Please, green hat, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, we got time for one last question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, so the question was, uh, we've talked a lot about the Linkerd proxy, but Linkerd also has an init container, it has an optional CNI, like, plug-in thing. How does eBPF play with all of that? Um, uh, I, so the way that I see eBPF working with Linkerd, and probably I'm gonna be corrected on this, but my guess is the thing that we can do there 
that would be most useful is if you were doing a pure TCP proxying through Linkerd and you're asking us not to do any L7 metrics at all because this is an application initiated TLS connection, for example, where we don't want a man in the middle of it, or it's you know some TCP stream where you're just like, I don't care, just get it to the other side. We could use eBPF to bypass a proxy and just like wire those two things together. Would that be done at the, you know through the init container through the CNI level? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure, but that's that's the intersection of the, all of those words that you said that, that that I'm aware of. All right, thank you, folks. Really appreciate your time here today. I'll be here, so come up and ask questions and use Linkerd.